Uh, so I think that's where the challenge with like chat GPT comes in is that if you are going to use it and get content that is not going to get AI detected, you have to put so many parameters in place when you're prompting and you really do need to learn how to become like an expert prompt engineer in order to get like good quality results every time. And that is really time consuming. And it is a process that just takes, you know, like hours and hours and different models give you different results for things. Welcome to a new episode of Digital Coffee Marketing Brew. And I'm your host, Brett Dyer. If you could please subscribe to this podcast on all your favorite podcasting apps and leave a review, it really does help. But this week, I have Maneksha Stewart with me, and she's an award winning AI and marketing specialist and the creator of Marketing Magic, because we all need a little marketing magic within our marketing strategies and plans. But it's basically an AI powered business growth tool that helps thousands of small business owners save 40 plus hours a month, which is always very helpful as well. But welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I love nothing more than a good nerdy chat about marketing and uh, AI. So I'm excited to chat with you more. All right. And the first question is all my guests is, are you a coffee or tea drinker? I am British, so I am absolutely a tea drinker, um, but my uh, family are Turkish. And so when they do have coffee, it's like really strong espresso style coffee that leaves coffee grounds in your mouth. <laughs> so um, maybe I just need to be introduced to good quality coffee that isn't quite as strong as that. Um, but I do love a cup of tea. Yeah, you're basically almost describing what we call in the United States cowboy coffee, which oh, basically the cowboys back then, they boiled the, the, the grounds within the pot and then they poured it and so you would get both yeah it's super super strong and my um like aunties will turn your cup over and then read your coffee grounds to tell you uh you know what tragedy might beset you in the next few months <laughs> i teach the zone i mean I, I i love both but do you have like any specific teas that you actually drink Yes, I really enjoy a good English breakfast tea. So just a nice English breakfast tea with a little bit of milk and it's a great way to start the day. Nice. So I gave a brief summary of your expertise. Can you give our listeners a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, so I started SEO in like 2005, uh, working in um, for $3 an article to rewrite artic uh, medical articles with keywords um, attached to them. So I um, have spent many years working in SEO subsequently to that. And then in 2017, I moved more towards being a freelance uh, head of marketing for thought leaders. So worked with um, quite a few people who have published books and have got podcasts and have got large on online audiences and a body of content and was doing a lot more around funnel building and uh, the sort of um, you know digital um, sales side of things for um, a variety of business models but ultimately a lot of knowledge commerce and from there um, just really have spent a lot more time on the sort of strategic elements of marketing and kind of enjoyed that a lot more. SEO is great. It's very repetitive. <laughs> um, and then with how technology has been changing since 2017, when Google really brought its first big machine learning update to its algorithm, how keyword um, intent has changed uh, things just in terms of, you know, genies have exact match keywords anymore. No, you don't, not really. So what does that mean when you're doing keyword research? Actually, you're more looking at customer journey and what the customer experience is and what needs and problems your customers have at each different stage of their uh, like online journey and then how you can make sure that your content or your messaging is meeting them at the point of their express need. So the interest in AI had kind of continued to build and grow from that. And obviously then OpenAI's a API became available in like early 2021, I think it was. And um, just being able to kind of look at generative AI and generative AI tools a little bit more and then just thinking through the um, overlap between how do we make sure that the AI content that we're creating retains the value and the context that our customers need so that we're not contributing to noise on the internet. We are instead being really intentional about the quality of marketing that we're putting out there and how we are showing up and serving our audience. So that's you know, a little bit of a sort of summary of some of the key areas of interest really that um, have have shaped my career on the internet. So SEO and AI, it seems like it's a match made in heaven in a way, because I mean, like you said, SEO is very repetitive and AI can help really well with a repetitive task. 
creativity needs a little work still, but so how, how can PR people and, and marketers like merge those twos and use them eff uh, effectively? Yeah. So, um, basically what we see with, um, like, so, so the first thing is that generative AI in particular is not, um, able to replace search engine, um, functionality because of, uh, like, you know, limitations around how large language models are built. So it can connect in. So we see that with chat GPT's like recent update where you, you now can get Bing results pulled into the chat interface, but ultimately it needs to be able to refer to the search algorithm because of things like recency and also for factual information, um, large language models hallucinate a lot and have a tendency to make things up. So, but what we are seeing with, um, like the, the AI technology is a really, it's a natural lead on from the search engine technology and the algorithms that we've been seeing um, in terms of updates from Google. The um, ability of a search engine to understand and determine context from the searches that we give to it has been you know, a part of that machine learning. And it's this idea that a search engine is trying to provide somebody with the best quality answers to the express needs that they've given at that time. What we have seen with the internet is that because of how um, quickly the volume of content has grown, people are actually getting incredibly overwhelmed by the amount of information that there is when they're searching for things. And so we're seeing like, you know, 16 million results for if you Google SEO checklist, you're getting 16 million results to filter through and you're having to filter your own context into each one of those results to determine like, oh, is this actually what I need? Is this what I need? Is this what I need? And so people's overwhelm levels, I think, are the reason that ChatGPT took off so quickly because people want to be able to search for something and actually have a contextual answer given to them. And so search engine is search engine technology is going to change because it has to, um, but also um, because users are just getting increasingly more um, aware of how much energy they spend being their own filter on the, on the internet for what they're looking for. So when we look at using AI as marketers, as PR professionals, as people in the business space, we're really looking at like, how do we use this AI tool to help us create um uh, contextual experiences for our customers that mean that they have what they need as quickly as possible. They have the answers, they understand the impact as quickly as possible without having to search for a needle in a haystack. And so I think like one of the trends that we are going to see in marketing is people just being much more comfortable with the idea of niche and exactly who it is that they serve and understanding that like their customers um, are going to need very specific things from them. And the people who can best um, anticipate the needs of their customers and respond to them are the ones who are going to have businesses that are sustainable in the next era of the internet. But as far as using it within our, you know, from an SEO perspective, um, one of the results um, um, of, of the generative AI trend has been Google's latest big algorithm update, which happened in March, which um, really targets very obviously spam content like spam content so spam brain is the algorithm and um it's picking out anything that looks like it's been mass created or created on a content farm and it is removing it from you know getting search visibility so one of the things that as we are moving forward is like yes we're using ai as a tool but if we are not using ai as a tool and providing a contextual framework for to guide the ai our results are going to struggle to get any traction or visibility organically because it is so easy to spot when AI content has been put into a blog post or published on a page without any sort of human interaction. So Google's already starting to penalize some of that activity and it gives us an opportunity in the marketing space to really be able to pull together our messaging, our positioning, our filters when it comes to what information is necessary, what information is needed, and like how do we create really good quality experiences for humans. And I think the way that I describe it is um, AI helps with the functional so you can get back to the fun. So there's always a prescriptive format that you might need to have for things like press releases, for blog posts, for emails, for launch assets, where certain pieces of information need to be described in a way that is clear and easy to understand. 
And that's where there's like a little bit more prescription in terms of the format. But then the creativity is like, how do we do advertising? How do we format our content? You know, we're talking in a podcast interview now, but if we were using, um, you know, let's you know, let's say we've we've managed to streamline a whole lot of um, stuff in our business that allows us to have a little bit more space or a little bit more profitability, what would it look like to have an illustrator animate sections of the podcast video to promote on social media or to send by ads so what we are able to see is that actually by automating some functional elements of our marketing and our sales in the online space we can open up space for creative ideas and for reformatting things um to make sure that our message lands with our ideal customers in a much more impactful way and using ai as a tool as part of the ideation process is great but we are ultimately still looking for um you know, value for our ideal customers um, as well that is that goes beyond just getting a checklist from ChatGPT. Gotcha. I mean, generative AI is also infecting, like, not infecting, but m merging in with, like, the creative side. So you have Adobe putting it into Premiere Pro. You have DaVinci doing some of it, but not as much. Adobe's all for it. Adobe's, like, full bore. We're going to, we're just, all our new features is AI, which yeah. I mean, teach his own. It could be good. It could be bad. So, I mean, like you said, Google is really targeting the farming of content from it. So how do you, how do you do it effectively? Because I mean, I'm a one man, one man show. And sometimes I get a little lazy with it and I'm like, well, it's good enough. Like I don't have time to like really fine tune and edit all this stuff. So how do you like, how do you make that balancing act? Because it's a balance between using it and then using yourself and injecting both of them. So how do you do it as a one man show? Effectively? So I think that's where the challenge with like chat GPT comes in is that if you are going to use it and get content that is not going to get AI detected, you have to put so many parameters in place when you're prompting and you really do need to learn how to become like an expert prompt engineer in order to get like good quality results every time. And that is really time consuming. And it is a process that just takes, you know, like hours and hours and different models give you different results for things. Um, with marketing magic, like the vision behind it was that we, um, you know, have a product where you don't need to provide all of that um, sort of context every time you need to do something functional in your marketing. So it really has pulled together my experience in product management and marketing and um, uh, helps small business owners create the sales and marketing assets for different elements and projects within their business, um, but also to repurpose content so that they're not having to spend hours and hours creating brand new, fresh content for their marketing because they might already have a body of work or they might already have a whole lot of um, stuff in one format that can be repurposed into another format. So the first way that I, the first thing that I built out actually was back in um, 2022. And it was a, um, like an AI tool that basically was built out in a Google sheet. And it took uh, transcripts from 130 interviews that I'd done for summits. And it repurposed them into like social media posts and blog posts using generative AI and it was a task that I had briefed my team to do but it was so repetitive that it just kept getting deprioritized and I was like there has to be an easy way of doing this like yes it's repetitive but ultimately it's a reformatting activity and so that was kind of where it started um but the the issue with a lot of AI at the moment and a lot of AI tools is that people are focusing on maybe, um, you know, enterprise level uh, projects and people, you know, companies and tools where it's like how you can build AI into your systems and your workflows. Um, the question that I wanted to solve for marketing magic was how do you make AI sound like you so that you don't have to manually make all of these edits to your content in order to get past AI content detectors and to make sure that it sounds like you as the person, the business owner, the author, the thought leader, the creative, and it replicates like 80% of what you need to do. And then that last 20% is you adding your sparkle to it on your unique um, you know, anecdotes and the things that AI doesn't know about you and shouldn't know about you. And so the question really with your, um, you know, workflow is like, okay, well, what do you, um, what do you need to do? What absolutely needs your original creative input to guide it? And then for the other things, um, you know, like 
launching a podcast episode there are assets that you need to create and actually once you understand what that looks like you understand what the tone of voice is there is a set standard that you have for your business um that can be automated and that can be put through tools that help um that preset to guide the like tone of voice and outputs so the context is the thing that allows you to then take a piece of content that ai has created um and either tweak it a little bit or not at all. You can, like with Marketing Magic, you can put copy straight out of it into an AI content detector and it thinks that it's like, it comes out as 100% human generated. Um, and some of the reasoning for that is because AI uses very, um, the AI detectors are looking at things like the inconsistent use of language and um, the way that logic uh, is, the AI deals with logic isn't great, um, punctuation and a little bit of chaos and then overly, overly perfect spelling and grammar often um, in some instances. So um, when you're prompting things to replicate your way of speaking, the amount of um, energy that that takes when you're doing a, a, a task by task basis almost doesn't always save you a lot of time. Um, but that is um, really the framework for creating, like it comes down to context. Context is the thing, like how do we build that in and how do we make sure that what we're getting out is contextually relevant? And then that context is the thing that is makes it undetectable to AI detectors <laughs> because AI only allows you to build out context if you've given it the framework within which to function and I, we see that with like um adobe as well like a good friend of mine um she's a, uh, one of my like really close friends actually but she's an ai um she's a sorry she's a ambassador for adobe and we talk about ai all the time and um the other day i was like doing something in ai and i was um asking it to extend with the extend function and I gave it a prompt based on the image and it was um it was like a statue and I was like asking it to add legs to the statue and all it did was just replace the whole image with some sideways legs of a statue and I was like that is so it's so far off like okay it's an image but it's not at all close to the image that I wanted it to be and it's like ultimately unusable um and so we're seeing things you know um roll out and I think with the generative visual stuff there are a lot more concerns around, um, you know, the the intellectual property of designers and creatives because the data sets that are, it's being trained on are just much more minimal. People are often finding that prompting those requires you to use actual artist names as a reference point. And then you're seeing a lot of like, you know, plagiarism in terms of style and all of that kind of thing. Um, but with Adobe, it's fascinating because it's really asking the question, like, what is um, what is the limit for us to alter reality for people and basically create something that's completely fictional or imagined? Um, and then, you know, what is our responsibility to, to disclose that to the people who are consuming it, whether it's on social media or it's, you know, in an art gallery? Like, what are the, what are the questions that we need to be um, thinking through around disclosing the use of AI in, in some of the stuff that really is um, changing what reality feels like for people. And I mean, going back to repurposing content, like I use like Opus Clips, for example, to repurpose this into shorts or squares for LinkedIn because LinkedIn is still on the old school way of videos. And so is, is that like the best use case for like repurposing things because it will add the transcripts for me. Also, there's other things that will dub my voice i haven't used them yet but i've seen them dub my voice in other languages so i don't have to find somebody to redub my voice it does it for me that looks natural is are those like good use cases for the generative ai because i mean like you said we we do have issues of deep fakes like putting people's faces into something that's and making them say something they didn't say that's the cons of ai so are there good use cases in using that to actually for good and not using it for like, like tanking someone's career, for example? Yeah, hundred percent. I think um, what I always would advise caution on is how readily we give our face and our voice to technology companies because um, 
that data, once it's out there, we kind of saw this with the 23andMe leak where like a hundred, uh, you know, it was like a million people's DNA was sold on the um, dark net. Um, so I think that with um, giving our voices, like we want to really understand what the terms and conditions are and what permissions we're granting for recordings of our voice and how they're going to be used and who they're going to be accessed by. So I think just as far as um, our data security and privacy is concerned, we do need to go into adopting some of these technologies with more open eyes than we have had so far, because a lot of people would not have put stuff on the internet if they had known it was going to be used to train an AI model without their permission. And I think that if we know that that has been done, we know that OpenAI, you know, it's got a lot of lawsuits at the moment. We know that that is a concern. Um, we want to be very cautious about giving away biometric data about us as people without understanding how that's going to be used and what our right to deleting that is, et cetera. So I think that those tools are incredible from being able to, you know, um, build our accessibility and make sure that the things that we're doing are ultimately serving um, like audiences in a way that we can't do if we're limited by our own time um, capacity. Um, but that, that, yeah, the caveat for the voice thing, because I had that conversation with someone today. It's like, you know, if you've got people who are um, a little bit older and they're wanting to tell stories, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different use cases for how that could really create special things for real humans. Um, but there's also just the, on the flip side, um, what does it look like um, and, you know, it's the right to be forgotten thing that Google kind of talks about quite a lot. Um, as far as repurposing content, um, I haven't actually per per personally tried any repurposing tools yet, um, which is ridiculous. But, you know, in terms of the, the, the tools that help with actual clips. Um, so that is on my to-do list for um, the next few, few weeks because I've just finished a big development run. But um, with the um, repurposing of um, clips for social media, um, love all of that kind of thing because it just means that you're not having to spend that time editing. Like, ultimately, it's like, how can you collapse time on the things that are taking you the bulk of your energy um, and make sure that you're getting stuff out there without having to be chained to your laptop all the time. Um, within Marketing Magic, the repurposing is taking the sort of transcript and repurposing into other marketing materials. So it's looking at things like how can you use a podcast episode to create a, you know, an evergreen email to nurture your email list? How can you take it and create some blog posts out of it? Um, you know, take the, the topics that have been discussed, create three or four different blog post ideas. How can you repurpose the content from a transcript, for instance, into like a, a cheat sheet or a challenge or something that is actionable for your audience if you're doing um, any kind of online training or um, service provision. So that's the, in terms of the, the elements of that. But um, there's also tools for like creating a web page content and, um, you know, your, your what does your homepage look like? Can you uh, use, you know, one or all of the sections to give your homepage a refresh to make sure that your brand is positioned in the best way possible? And the idea really with anything when we're approaching AI is like, do I do I need to learn this now or am I trying to learn it to make up for a weakness that I feel like I have? And is it from a place of inse personal insecurity or ego that I feel like I need to learn this manually? Or can I use a tool that helps me automate this so that I don't need to learn how to do it from scratch and instead I can um, you know, do it more quickly and then spend more time in my zone of genius, in the thing that I'm really good at, in the thing that I love to do and that gives me creative flow. And so I think that's the question for a lot of people is like the, there are some things that you choose to do because you really enjoy it and you get a lot of professional fulfillment out of it there are other things that you do because you feel like you should do them and I think the nice thing about AI is that we can take the should do's and we can think about ways to make them feel a little bit less like a chore or a you know burden on our to-do list and instead um, we can get them done quickly and move on to spending more time doing the things that we know we can really have an impact with. Yeah, it seems like for a lot of repetitive tasks, machines, AI are really, really good at that. And humans are pretty terrible at it because yeah. we just don't like to do repetitive things over and over again because then we get bored and then our mind wanders and then we kind of don't do it very well. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, it's the, the what is intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence, as we're looking at it, is ultimately automating some of the cognitive decision-making processes, but they're not really... <laughs> 
necessarily big decisions to be made often like in the repurposing of transcripts where you've already got the content and it's just a case of reformatting it as an example of that so you know the, the way that the job market is going to shift the way that work and the idea of work is going to shift I think we are going to see roles that previously were around you know um data um entry and things like that just look like uh, you know, a different. It's a it's a different format, but within the AI space, we're going to see more and more jobs that are sort of equivalent to that, but they're they're, they're applying in different ways. And then also, um, being a you know being a filter and looking at how we can use human you know use human expertise to shape some of these systems and guide the quality um, of them as well. So um, I always reference the data information knowledge wisdom pyramid because um, I think it's particularly good for anyone who's in the professional space to understand that AI can help with the sort of data information and now because of generative AI a little bit with the knowledge but it, it struggles to get to the wisdom point because the wisdom requires us to have um, cultural context, emotional intelligence, um, you know, an awareness of um, the cultural context in which we exist as business owners. And so if we are able to take our own profession and kind of look at it through the lens of, okay, well, what is the what is the wise thing here? Or like, what's the wise takeaway? What is the contextually relevant takeaway for this particular, um, you know, person, audience, uh, business? Um, that's where we continue to be able to grow our careers, our platforms, our professions, um, even with the use of AI, because AI is a tool that enables us to, um, you know, filter out some of the noise. Um, but ultimately, we are still going to need to be the filter that ensures that the quality of what's going out there is relevant to the contexts and the um, environments in which we're doing business. So let's say like a student or someone, a marketer still in the industry, how can they start to figure this out? Because I mean, right now it's, you can use AI, but you don't need to use it. Eventually it's going to be, you need to understand AI or you're just not going to get a job anymore. Yeah. So I think it's um, a really um, good thing, obviously, to be using the different models as they're coming out. And I would um, always uh, suggest that people have a like hobby or a project or something they know enough about to find it interesting and to be able to understand like the nuance of it. Like, and it could be you know, it could be something that topically is completely unrelated to your professional work, um, but you know enough about it to be able to prompt the AI engine and see how well the results come back. And so figuring out, um, you know, how to use ChatGPT, being very cognizant that ChatGPT, if you're just using it as is, you're putting stuff into the public domain when you do that. So you need to be super cautious about what you're putting into um, ChatGPT. Um, but then also like, you know, try out Claude as well and um, see what kind of different results the large language models generate. Um, and then when you think about your actual day-to-day -day work and the things that you are doing day-to-day, -day, I would always recommend keeping a bit of an energy audit to see what are the things that you're doing that are draining you the most. And then of those things, can you look at ways of simplifying them or making them go faster by getting AI's help with it? So again, you need to be very careful about putting any like personal data or anything to do with like business data customer data your own information into some of these tools but um even if it's um you know setting up spreadsheets and things like that um chat gpt can help with formulas and it can help with simple you know code fixes um if you're an email marketer and you're trying to center something you can put the code the html into chat gpt and it corrects it so there's a lot of things like that where it might consume a lot of time or it might be something that you find draining and actually you can start to build in the use of ai in your workflows in a way that means that you're able to move on to the next thing and um you know be <laughs> be able to like move past the the things that you don't enjoy a little bit more quickly um and you can also use it to take the initiative right let's um you know if you're you if you're early or mid career or you're a student and you're just starting out the um there is information that is available to you on the internet that 
people who are very senior in your industry do not know and um, or the amount of time that you would need to be in the industry in order to be able to get that information is really significant. So you can use it to take the initiative if you've got big projects coming up, if there's something where you're working on a campaign, um, you can use it to get insights into the ideal customers, to get different ideas for how you might be able to approach um, the marketing or the campaign in a different or fresh way. And, um, you know, asking for customer insights and things like that is a really good way to make sure that your marketing, regardless of your industry size, your business size, is really impactful. Um, So there are ways that you can kind of shortcut the um, learning process to kind of give yourself the edge when it comes to working uh, within a team and progressing within your uh, career path as well. And so, I mean, for example, like I use perplexity to help me with questions for like podcast guests, and it actually does a pretty good job at it. So it's like that stuff w- would, cause it's not, it's not damaging. I do like, like AI and like, it's very topical type of a thing. Yeah, would yeah. that be like some of the thing that, that would be okay for it to actually do? Because I mean, like I said, there's perplexity there's Claude, there's Gronk. If you have Twitter premium, there's, I think Meta is slowly bringing out its own on its own social sites as well. You have LinkedIn that has their own that are, unless if you're a premium member, you can actually use as well. So is it that type of thing? Like, I think that LinkedIn, I know that Notion connects in with Claude and Anthropic's model. Um, I think LinkedIn, I'm not sure if theirs is a proprietary or whether that links into something else. But um, Meta's is interesting because you can actually download it and have it on your hardware. So it's completely disconnected from the cloud. Um, anyway, that's, that's a that's a, that's a t- nerdy little tech wormhole for another day. But um, as far as, um, yeah, using it, if, if there's something in the public domain as well, like it's it's not it doesn't do any harm to put it through AI because it's already in the public domain. So especially for things like podcast guest interviews, um, it's great because you can take like a whole load of text that is on someone's website and um, you can get some summary questions and pull out the things that are most interesting and then go back and skim read if you want to. But for things like that, it's great because it's helping with the sort of data processing of um, you know potentially large amounts of information, a lot of which you don't need to know, um, a lot of which you just you know you're only processing it so that you can pull out of it the things that you do need so for things like that it's really really incredibly helpful and i i just saw it recently that claude just brought out like a their own web it's, it's their own website for their own prompts too so that that will help you like figure out how to do this because it's just just like searching through google like there's the there's correct prompts to do just for ai too there's correct prompts to do because if you don't have the correct prompt you might not get the best answer exactly garbage in garbage out so um any any time i'm like um uh, creating a prompt um the the thing that I would suggest is that you are providing it with context. So what is the context of the um, uh, instruction that you're giving it um, and um, try to structure it super clearly and give it a very clear then instruction and a required format. Um, so you want to make sure that in your context, you're, you, you know, you're, you're giving it the framework of like what your role is, what your job is, what the task is that you're doing. Um, if you've got raw text or raw data, be very clear about what the raw data is and then be very clear about what you want it to do with it. Um, it will only respond to you based on the string of text that you put into it. It will respond based on the probability that you want to get that back. So if you word things even slightly differently, it can dramatically change how the results um, come back to you because of the way the language models work in terms of probability. So if you're seeing like a really like not great result it's worth trying the same prompt like two or three times to see how changing your language very slightly can impact the quality of the result that you get out of it when it comes to um yeah processing commands and things all right and people listen to this podcast and they're wondering where can they find you to find more information about marketing magic or just ai in general yeah, so you can head over to my website. It's Um, There are no other Manexhas uh, that I found in the marketing space, uh, not in the UK anyway. So I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn and on social media. Um, but my uh, website has got uh, some short form, uh, like three minute podcast interview, uh, not interviews, episodes that talk about like 
the jargon behind AI and things like that. So um, there's a few resources there if you're interested in hearing more about it. Um, but yeah, otherwise, uh, find me, uh, send me a DM. I'm always happy to answer questions. All right. Any final thoughts for our listeners? Yeah, just um, thanks for listening. If you're um, at the end of the podcast episode, and um, you know AI has been a part of our economic system since the late '80s, um, it isn't going anywhere. It informs a huge amount of our logistics infrastructure for big companies like Amazon. Um, generative AI is obviously newer on the scene, but it is something that is the end result of a you know decades long um, development. So even though it feels unnerving to tackle it, it is something that if you are going to be in the professional space uh, in the next even three years, uh, you do want to spend a little bit of time just getting to grips with it and kind of starting to understand how to use it and to feel comfortable with it and how your value as a human is not threatened um, by using AI as a tool because the things that you bring are significantly, um, you know, more contextually driven as an embodied human AI does not have the ability to experience things in the way that you have um so uh, just making sure that you feel super comfortable about the fact that you are more than your to-do list you're more than your ability to be super produ- productive and um you know looking at your uh, future professional work through the lens of the wisdom that you bring the experiences that you bring and the cultural context and creativity that you bring to roles is going to mean that you can use AI and feel much more confident and thank you for listening to digital coffee marketing brew as always please subscribe to digital coffee marketing brew on all your favorite podcasting apps with a five-star review and join us next week as we talk to another great editor in the pr industry all right guys stay safe get to understanding ai and the different ai models and the correct prompts and see you next week later